What do you mean you're quitting? Why? The news is good. You don't have can't the thing. Do you realize what a thread we're all hanging by? Mickey, you're off the hook. You should be celebrating. Can you understand how meaningless everything is? Everything. I'm talking about in our lives, the show, the whole world. It's meaningless. Yeah, but you're not dying. No, I'm not dying now, but... But, you know, when I ran out of the hospital, I, I was so thrilled because they told me I was going to be all right. And I'm running down the street, and suddenly I stopped because it hit me. All right, so, you know, I'm not going to go today. I'm okay. I'm not going to go tomorrow. But eventually, I'm going to be in that position. You're just realizing this now? Well, I don't realize it now. I know it all the time, but, but I managed to stick it in the back of my mind. Because it's a very horrible thing to think about. Yeah. What? Can I tell you something? Can I tell you a secret? Yes, please. A week ago, I bought a rifle. No. I went into a store. I bought a rifle. I was going to, you know, if they told me I had a tumor, I was going to kill myself. The only thing that might have stopped me, might have, is my parents would be devastated. I would, I would have had to shoot them also, first. And then I have an aunt and uncle. I would have, you know, it would have been a bloodbath. Well, you know, eventually it, it is going to happen to all of us. Yes, but doesn't that ruin everything for you? That makes everything, you know, it, it just takes the pleasure out of everything. I mean, you're going to die, I'm going to die, the audience is going to die, the network's going to, the sponsor, everything. I know, I know, and, and your hamster. Yes! Listen, kid, I think you snapped your cap. <sighs> Maybe you need a few weeks in Bermuda or something, or go to a whorehouse. <laughs> I think I rushed them go to the whorehouse, but oh well. <laughs> Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rolaine. Each episode of the Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select, and we will discuss why that film is significant to us. We are here on episode three now, and the selection is Erica's this time, so let's find out what she has in store for us. And I chose Hannah and Her Sisters, uh, directed by Woody Allen, also written by Woody Allen, from 1986. And I turned to you before we started watching this the other day, and I said, I love this movie. And I've got a lot to say about the film, but that is the most simple thing that I can come up with about it. Um, Beyond that... Show's over. <laughs> Done. That was the shortest episode of the Magic Lantern <laughs> on record. So uh, to get into some detail about why I love this film and why I chose this film, I remember watching, as I did so often back then, uh, Siskel and Ebert at the movies. And they reviewed this film so highly it ended up being in, I believe, each of their top three lists for the year. And I remember the review of this, and I remember the scene that they chose, which was the lunch scene with the three sisters uh, in the sort of revolving camera. And I thought, oh, this sounds fantastic. I can't wait to see this. And I was uh, 11 at the time. So I, I didn't see it in the theater which wasn't an odd thing. We just, I guess, just didn't go. Uh, but so I had to wait to see it on video when it came out and, uh, we rented it. I watched it by myself in our living room at dusk, which is the perfect time to watch this film. I highly recommend that also in autumn, which is, uh, also a wonderful time to watch this film. And, Watched it all the way through, and then when it was over, I rewound it and watched it again. And it has stayed with me ever since. In my mind then, and as I have watched it many, many, many times over the years, it still remains an incredibly romantic film for me. Not just the story or the performances or the music or the setting, but all of those things together. And it also inspired me 
from a very pivotal uh, scene in the film to find E.E. E. Cummings. And so when I was old enough, I drove myself to the local bookstore, got the book, started then, and I still have the book, and it's in our bookshelf right over in the other room. I also uh, chose the poem from the film, uh, Nobody, Not Even the Rain Has Such Small Hands, and I performed it in senior English class with a friend of mine. <laughs> we had to choose a poem and then do a an, an, uh, live performance piece, and so my friend did a ballet piece, and I read it, and uh, everyone was highly moved, I'm sure. Was it the first Woody Allen that you had seen? No, I saw Love and Death because during that time, A&E used to show it all the time. So I probably saw it five times in a month or something like that. So I saw Love and Death. I'd also already seen Manhattan. So Mm. I was exposed to a few things. And I knew who Woody Allen was and followed other films of his. But this was the one that really changed everything for me. But still, for an 11-year-old... That being your third Woody Allen movie, yes. that's pretty heady stuff for a, a kid. Why do you think you responded to it so much at that age? I I think, this is my personal opinion, I'm sure shared by many though, and, and probably written about ad nauseum, but I think it's his most accessible film that could possibly be the voiceover or specific choices, but... Every character lets you in to their interior, to their thoughts, to their interior monologue. And so it's so clear to follow. And it's at its basis, he says, several characters will say this, love is mysterious. I can't fathom the human heart. And that appealed to me, I guess, for whatever reason, my gullible romantic, maybe. Do you remember seeing this the first time? I do. Uh, I didn't see it in the theater the first time, but I saw it on home video as soon as it was released on VHS, which was shortly after the theatrical run, I was a big Woody Allen fan already up to that point. I was 16 at that point, so yes. I had a big head start on you. And so I had seen Love and Death, which remains a favorite, and all of the big stuff. Annie Hall, Sleeper, Manhattan, Take the Money and Run, pretty much anything that was in print on VHS, I had seen it by that point. And I remember what a big deal. I remember the thing you were saying about how Siskel and Ebert put it on their top three and everyone seemed to do it. I want to say Vincent Canby did in the New York Times. And at the time, I guess it made sense because he was kind of drawing in all the disparate threads that, you know, one film would be dominated by the slapstick. Prior to that, with a film like Interiors, it would be dominated by the family drama. And somehow with Hannah and her sisters... He managed to pull all of that together into a cohesive whole and, like you said, make it accessible. In retrospect, though, I I feel like it has not aged as well as Annie Hall or Manhattan. Gotcha. Okay. Why do you think that? And I don't know that I necessarily disagree. I don't... Okay. I shouldn't say it hasn't aged as well. I... What I mean is it was heralded at the time as the best Woody Allen film to date. Which, in retrospect... Was it? I didn't realize that. Yeah, a okay. number of reviews said that about it. And I can see where it being the newest, freshest, most accessible thing would make people say that. But I think in retrospect, years down the line, I still like Annie Hall and especially Manhattan and Stardust Memories better. And maybe because they speak specifically to me, whereas this film speaks more specifically to you. Yes. But I think... It was a little overrated at the time. Not to say that it's not great. I do love it. But I don't love it as much as Annie Hall, Manhattan, or especially Stardust Memories. And I don't think that it's better than Annie Hall or Manhattan, too, that I absolutely love. I think, and probably speaking more to the accessibility, it is all heart. It's all heart. And it has a happy ending on many levels. And so uh, it's gonna come. It's gonna come off in this rosy. It's gonna have this rosy glow to it, whereas the others are so much more bittersweet. To me, it has a happy ending on only one level, really? and that's the level he wrote for himself. Not for you. Don't think that Lee has a happy ending. You don't think that. Should we back up and do a okay. little synopsis? Talk about, talk about the movie itself, so first. we can see how we get okay. there, because. Okay. 
maybe maybe you will maybe you'll agree with me maybe you won't by the time we get there okay. but um I think that's a little crazy. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think you're thinking of it Maybe you're thinking of it as your 11-year-old self to a large degree still. Well, I could. Can, I could. Okay. We'll see why. I'll also, tell you what I mean. My 11-year-old self was so enamored of the idea that I could be uh, slow dancing with my partner in a hotel room in an afternoon Some at some point that adults did that. Right. Your sister's husband. That's true. Good point. Okay. All right. So backtracking for a second. <laughs> Super okay. romantic. Okay. <laughs> Also, let me just say something, and I'll probably come back to this again, but we had a discussion about this idea with a couple of other films. And in this one, uh, the idea is that everyone is at their most beautiful to me in this. When I look at it now, Diane Weist is at her most beautiful, Barbara mm-hmm. Hershey and uh, and um, Mia Farrow and... Everyone just looks mm. gorgeous. Carrie Fisher looks beautiful. I prefer the Rosemary's Baby Mia Farrow. That's her second most beautiful. Mm, okay. We'll she was young. And, she's a she's a woman now. Okay. In this, <laughs> she was but a young girl then. Okay. So to talk about the uh, the plot synopsis of the movie, we have three sisters: Hannah, Holly, and Lee. And uh, they were raised by their, uh, I don't know, washed up, troubled acting parents, boozy. I wouldn't say washed up, but just as much as they never quite made it where they wanted to. Or where they thought they should have been. Right. So uh, we're now in their, all the sisters are now in where they're mid to the mid 40s, 30s to 40s at some varying, varying ages. I would say. You think Does that so? Seem you think reasonable? Barbara Hershey's character is that age? I don't think so. I think she's in her mid thirties. What do you think? Um. Okay. Maybe. Okay. So we've got three sisters, Hannah, Holly, and Lee, and they are. Uh, Hannah is married to Elliot, who's played by Michael Caine, and Hannah is an actress. Elliot is a financial planner or agent or something like that for rock stars and douchebags for rock stars and douchebags and it, Woody Allen's rock star idea being Daniel Stern <laughs> and then we have uh Holly who is the offbeat wayward the ex-dope fiend sister the middle sister. the middle sister and Lee who is the youngest sister who is in a relationship with Frederick your favorite character Max von Sydow right whom I identify with the most of any of these people, probably. Right. Which, does that mean I should identify most with Lee? Because I don't know that I, I think do. you do. I don't think it has anything to do with me being Max von Sydow. Okay. But I think I think that's that's your way into this. Maybe. Now Holly is the person I identify with most. Hmm. But, it, well, also Hannah to a degree, now that I'm a wife. A lot of the things that she talks about, I feel more keenly now. Anyway. Have I gotten any further into the plot or synopsis? Uh, somewhat. Somewhat? somewhat. Okay. So it's just an examination of uh, pretty much a year in their life, would you Two say? Years. Two years. in their life. It's framed by... Thanksgiving to right. Thanksgiving. Right. There are three of them. There's... To Thanksgiving. Exactly. Yes. Okay. And uh, it's it just follows different events that happen, one of them being uh, infidelity between Lee and Elliot and uh, Hannah not being aware of it, and Holly re- discovering herself as a writer um, and uh, the, the power struggles or just the emotional struggles each of them has to be their own person. What do you think? think what would that- you change or add to that? Oh, and then also Woody Allen's in it. He is Mickey, Hannah's ex-husband. Who eventually becomes Holly's, Holly's new husband. New husband at the very end. No, I think that sums it up just fine. Okay, all right. Give this is a start. Okay, so hit me with your whole uh, nobody has a happy ending except the one Woody Allen wrote for himself. Well, he's all over the thing, first of all. Yeah. It's not just that he wrote a happy ending for himself. He wrote himself into this movie about half a dozen times. If you look in backgrounds, Uh his assistant that's walking down the hall with him um, right before they encounter John Turturro, whose dialogue has been taken out of the show. Louis Black. That's him. That's that's one of his doppelgangers. Julie Kavner is obviously an extension of him. Yeah. The two 
hospital technicians that are running the CAT scan are Nebushi CAT scan versions of him. Would you also argue Groucho Marx is, uh, is his version oh, of him? Oh, without a doubt. Okay. And then eventually, at the very end, he's generated a baby, which is the next him. He is He's peppered himself throughout the screenplay okay. so that no matter what's happening or where you look, he's there, even if he's not doing voiceover at the time. Anyway, the reason I say there's only a happy ending for Mickey and Holly is because think about where the others are in their cycle, mm-hmm. in this story. Yes. No one else knows about the infidelity. Right. The other two sisters. Yes. I don't think Holly even puts it together, really. I I don't know that it necessarily occurs to her. I don't think it does. So, what eventually has to happen with those people? Either Elliot comes clean, which is going to cause severe trauma, if not a massive schism in the family, Mm -hmm. or he carries it around with him for the rest of his life, he and Lee both, until one, two, or three of them die. I don't know. Then it becomes Chekhov, doesn't it? Essentially, then. And you're using that to argue that it's a happy ending? That's (laughs) true. That's a good point. Um... Well, okay, so it's a happy, it's a two year long happy ending. It's a happy end with no D. There's n- there's no end. It's a happy middle. No, there's no happy middle either. They haven't dealt with this. They have to deal with this. Mickey and Holly get to be happy because they came to their situation with each other. Honestly yes, and openly. Of their own free will. No one was lied to. No one was cheated on. The others still have this to solve. They still have this to work out, which is going to be terrible for all concerned whenever oh. it happens, if it happens. Man. Or they carry a terrible secret to their graves. Whew. I just felt the cold Arctic wind blow through the house. That's... Uh, Bergman. Yeah. Is what that is. Yeah. You feel the ghost of Ingmar Bergman throughout this whole thing. Okay. Well, then it bears rewatching by me. Yeah, I don't exactly see how. Well, I do see. I see and I don't see. Because people want to be needed. Sure. Yes. Yeah. And it's a. I'm going to say the rosy glow again. It casts a rosy glow of uh, music and kissing. And dancing in hotel rooms, and then people still love each other. And I don't, I don't have, I don't have a good explanation. I don't have a good explanation. That, no, it's a perfectly good explanation, but it's ultimately dishonest. Ultimately, almost all the characters are being dishonest. At yes. least, yes, yes. So this rosy glow that you perceive in the film, yes. Has to do with what? How strongly you identify with characters in the film? Obviously, that's got to be what it is. With all of his other stuff, it's not necessarily direction. It's clearly writing and performances. Yes. Uh, With his stuff. And this is very... These are all very, very strong performances for me. I think his direction and and choices of camera movement actually really stand out in this. And I'm going to talk about accessibility again. Because the camera's always moving... It's always and it's trained on faces and sort of later period Woody Allen for me is marked by um, the camera is pointed where the action is not happening. So you're often just listening to something or you're not seeing reaction shots or you're trained on someone else's reaction shot that doesn't give you that eye into what are you actually saying and thinking and feeling and doing. And this film, I think, in a very simple way, actually, maybe overly simplistic trains on those reactions and the dialogue and the emotion and the physicality it's it's accessible direction it's accessible camera work there are very few wide shots it's all it's close up it's a two person tied in it's a lot of that stuff it's funny that you say something about late period because to me 
I think of this as late period. I realized ah, as I was thinking okay. about this uh, a little bit after we watched it. I think of this as middle period. It. Yes, it is. Very, yeah. Or even early, because when yeah. I hit you with this number, I think you're going to be surprised. I think of early as bananas, take the money and run, yes. sleeper. Yeah. I think of middle as really hitting stride with Annie Hall, Stardust Memories, Manhattan. I think of late period as starting with this and then going through husbands and wives, crimes and misdemeanors. And that's sort okay. of where it ends for me yeah because who knows what else has i haven't kept up since then i haven't been compelled to by anything he's done i read a ton of great things obviously about things like blue jasmine and kate blanchett's performance Mm -hmm. and all of that but i'm not moved to chase after them the way i used to be i'm not either and so I, i think i saw what's what was the one that was the musical everyone says i love you yes i saw that and I don't have anything more to say. <laughs> that band, period. But since, how many films would you guess he's made since Hannah and Her Sisters? Since Hannah and Her Sisters. So 1986 and the year is now 2015, right? right? So Not he, counting TV, not counting shorts. Feature okay. films that he has um, directed. I'm going to say 25. 30. Okay, cause and the one that's solid. in production right now. He does a movie a year, doesn't he? He's right. sort of famous for that. Right. Okay. So I think Hannah Jesus and her sisters was the, right. was the 14th. So it is very Holy clearly thing. the early period. Yes. When it comes to just wow. chronologically. God, okay. So mm. I, have a, I have a skewed yeah. understanding of, of the timeline. Yeah. Because for me, it ends somewhere in the late 90s. Okay. Huh, cold Arctic wind blowing in again. <laughs> All right. Um, well, Ro- Rosie Glow, so you started to ask me again about where do I get this idea or wh- what does the Rosie Glow come from and identifying with characters. And I think, I think at least when I was 11, it was a little bit more aspirational, if that's even the word. I had this idea. To me, it seemed fully grounded in the adult world. Right. There, there's, there are no teenagers. There are no twenty somethings. There, nobody like that. It's, it's adult world, and that seemed to me incredibly romantic. And it was in New York that um, I only kind of learned from him, and locations I wouldn't see really in anything else. And I still realized that I'd never want to live there, especially in Lee's neighborhood, that looks terrible. But I digress. So, fully grounded in the adult world. But she lives where all those great bookstores are. She does, but everything else looked like um, burned out apocalypse to me. You know, that was the book row, essentially. Was it? Where pageant was. Yeah. Where the pageant book yeah, and print you, shop was. That's the place I want to go to. Well, it's not the same anymore. Oh, it opened in 1946, and it was basically in the general vicinity. Had to move a couple of times uh-huh. with on the same street or around the corner, um, staying you know within a block or two, essentially of that same place. Um, but they closed in 1999. Oh no! To go virtual only, oh. and they tried that for five years, and then they've reopened since 2005 as a print shop exclusively. Oh, okay. so it's not that romantic. Yeah. Packed come, to the rafters yeah, bookstore anymore. Come, come and stay all afternoon and read all day and you don't have to buy anything. And Yeah, unfortunately it's not the same. And I think they still sell some of their rare book collection online, yeah. but it's not uh, brick and mortar that way anymore. This is coming a real downer of an episode. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, let me get back to that rosy glow again. The music. Right. Um, you, I think, asked me in the last episode about the idea of uh, did you feel like you had been initiated into a club? And for this film, I did because, or like a club that I had was sort of aware of uh, and then realized, oh, I know these songs. I've watched these other movies that these songs featured in. And that to me felt so special. Again, grounded in the adult world, I felt like I was being initiated into that adult world. It's funny how, with all of the connections to Bergman that this film has, and what a hero of Alan's Bergman is, because Ingmar Bergman would not use music, detested it, I would almost say, yes. in that capacity, 
and Woody Allen uses it for everything. Everything. It, it animates almost every scene of all of the great, all of his great films. Anyway, um, like I said, I haven't kept up with things as much, but I would suspect that it's probably still his use of music is probably still the same. And I'm, that probably, I mean, that stems from him just loving and playing and yes, being a, being a music lover. fan his entire life where I don't think Bergman had the same thing. This movie for me comes the closest to actually having underscoring mm -hmm. than lots and lots of other movies that I watch or anything that I would that I would allow because normally I despise underscoring. Is it a cheat? Yes. It because is. it certainly evokes... It swells up in the beginning, and it never goes down too low, except when people are reminiscing or playing for each other on the old piano when their photos are all around of their life together. Yeah, it's 100% a cheat, and I eat it up. I do the same with Manhattan. Manhattan's yeah. even more like that, I think, if you go back and watch it again with all the Gershwin... Mm -hmm. That was the impetus for Manhattan, essentially, was all of those Gershwin songs. Yeah. So, It's all Rhapsody in Blue, isn't it? That's, is that Manhattan? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, his, his use of that stuff is unavoidable. And I guess I, I, don't have, I, I don't have a quibble with it. It certainly functions the way he intends it to. It's not, say, a Forrest Gump cheat. No. Well, is it? Is it? it? Because it's, all, manipulative. It's, it's just a different generation. It's a different demographic he's not using say buffalo springfield to trigger all of these associations he's using bewitched bothered and bewildered which is going to do the exact same thing for just a different strata of his audience so i was an 11 year old watching it <laughs> and i got some of the some of the songs enough of the songs to really understand what was going on what would an 11 year old now would they get would their little 11 year old heartstrings get tugged the same way that mine did some would but they would be the distinct minority but only in the same way that you were the distinct minority of the 11 year olds you knew yeah this rosy glow thing that we keep talking about yes and how i was thinking when we watched it to get ready for this specifically wondering if there were certain episodes in the film that you related to that made it really hit home for you, not necessarily as an 11 year old, but as you've grown up and watched it again and again, like you said, there are things that, that all of the characters do that I was curious if you've ever found yourself doing those sorts of things. Oh gosh. When she's in the cab, for instance, on the way home, when Barbara Hershey is in the cab on the way home the first time and that intoxicating feeling of someone's attention and what that felt like to you if you were watching that prior to ever having experienced that and that somehow informed your real life later at some point or had you already gone through that? I guess at 11 you hadn't, obviously. No. You pr you hadn't gone through any of these things unless at 11 you were sleeping with your sister's uh, boyfriend or husband. No. Sadly, I did not have a sister. Which is another thing I wanted to ask you okay. about. Th this whole thing is filtered through this sororal dynamic. Of which I have, I am an only child, so I have no experience whatsoever right. with so, sibling relationships. So how did that play for you? What did that mean to you at all when you were watching these sisters interact? And did you feel like you were understanding what they were trying to put across? The only thing I have to compare are other relationships with other women I get well I mean it really any close relationship is the closest I can possibly get to a sibling relationship and but I, but I don't know that I ever experienced anything especially in sort of that triad where you have these deep-seated intentions accusations all of this history, so you think that something's going on, and you don't necessarily allow someone to change and evolve, maybe. You don't always give them the benefit of the doubt, but also it comes with a great amount of love. And so, n no, I, I hadn't, I haven't experienced anything like that. All I have are movies and TV, and that 
shows all sorts of different dynamics. And then in my personal life, I have a very close friend who has three sisters. So there are four sisters total. They are the closest people I've ever seen. So I had that to compare. So no, it was, it was all sort of, it was kind of a mystery to me. I think about the scene with Lee after she, or as she's reading the poem and she's in bed by herself and she's having this moment for herself and she's struck so, uh, so deeply by not only the words, but she's starting to understand what's being conveyed to her. Mm -hmm. And that was very moving to me. What? Because you wanted that? I wanted that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Everyone wants to be wanted. Is that what you said a few um, minutes ago? Or needed yeah, or loved needed. or whatever it is that Needed versus that. wanted. And, and and that's what occurs to me with uh, Hannah's voiceover later in the film when she's talking about feeling completely lost and in the dark. After she's argued with Elliot, clearly something is wrong. She knows something's wrong. And she has been told that she essentially has no needs and it's terrible being with someone who's so self-sufficient. She gets that from a number of different angles. And uh, that to me is something I respond to now Why do that you... I didn't really, I didn't totally get then. What's the difference between you then and you now? Being older, ha- being responsible to other people, being responsible to myself. I don't, I don't know that I can fully explain it without being so personal and, but it, it's just something that means a lot to me now, that I understand now. Well, what about other situations, I guess? The things that I thought about that I specifically noted, um, one of them when Diane Weist is in the back of the car when he, okay, yes, Sam I can, Waterston I can is going relate to, to being the third wheel. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, being the, uh, I want to stay in this car. Let me manufacture a way to prolong this, but everyone wants you out. <laughs> yeah. I've been there. Uh, running around the block to stalk someone? <laughs> to pretend like you're just running uh, into them? Taking way too long in the walk-in freezer so that when you come out, the person's right there at the counter. I've done that. <laughs> yeah. And poems woo women for sure right that's that's one of the object that's lessons the lessons yeah true not true don't they do woo you debunk all that? humans unless you have no soul how often do you see it played the other way though <sighs> not nearly enough right that's the movie i'm gonna write <laughs> no you're right it is usually deployed the other way but how can you not read those words and feel something he wrote it for you to feel something and what about the thing that Barbara Hershey is doing, where she all of these things that she's ignoring or glossing over to reap the benefit of this infatuation? I know I have been there. I know I have taken the road of, number one, being the student. Oh, there, yeah, there's being, a ton of that. She's, yeah. she's looking for a mentor yeah. everywhere. Yes, yes. But not just a mentor, a lover. A lover. And I've done that. And then making another bad choice right after it. And then hopefully making a better choice. Who knows? But yeah, I I I can relate to that. I wanted to ask you about this. There's the moment that seems totally glossed over where she, when he runs around the block to stalk her, she is on the way to her AA meeting. And then aren't they drinking wine when they're dancing in the hotel room later on? I think so. Yeah, that's just. Meh. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I, <laughs> I didn't notice that. Before. Sort of. It's, I think it's played for laughs. Are there other things that you noticed the first time? This time we watched it. The what? The big thing I noticed this last time that we watched it is when he is when Mickey is walking around the park and there are the joggers going past him right <laughs> the one he talks about the, the disparaging person that he talks about the the heavier woman to me she doesn't seem so heavy now as when i was a kid that's the thing that occurs to me <laughs> also i want to wear everything that holly wears every bit of a wardrobe except for the fur she has the best pants the best shoes the best dresses the best coats anyway that's the fashion segment of our podcast 
Well, the character that I identify with most is Max von Sydow's character, Frederick. And why do you identify with him? Because he is pragmatic and perceptive and misanthropic, I guess. <laughs> There's no rosy glow happening no. there. Well, yes and no. And the, But the thing I wanted to ask you about what you thought about his character, when Lee finally leaves him, after she's had the affair with Michael Caine's character, mm -hmm. and she finally decides that this is going to be a jumping off point for her new life. And he gets so upset saying, you know, a couple of times that he always knew that this was going to happen mm -hmm. because of their age difference and other things. Does the character really care that much? Is he that crestfallen by this happening? Or is that some sort of display? And do you think that character more easily moves on than everyone else? I... Because she is his only tether his only to connection the to the world, he says. He says that. He only wants to be with her. Or he or he can only stand to be with her. Right. I can't That's even remember like what it. his words were. <laughs> That's more like it. Well, in Woody Allen universe, I would sort of take that as he feels like that he's getting old. Again in Woody Allen universe. Not gotcha. in not in our universe. But he would take it as um this is confirmation that I am no longer appealing somehow and also in Woody Allen universe if he were different then he would go out and find an 18 year old probably but those are later 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 period or oh they? no Manhattan, Manhattan predates that yeah so uh I don't know did I answer your question probably not okay no you I think, I think you did okay. I think you did well does he care you know he it, it's I think it's back to your point of everyone wants to be needed where his central points to her were she she was so happy at first to listen to every everything that he wanted to talk about sit at and the master's feet sit at the master's feet all the books and the films and everything that he opened her up to and and he felt completely comfortable doing that that's how he felt good and got his affirmation i don't know is it a, is it a mistake to even have max von Sydow do that who i think of being as more powerful and self-realized you mean it's a mistake should to he, cast him yeah, should as he, that? Should he have had someone... No one else could have delivered the monologue about <laughs> watching television Special wrestling. and when Jesus comes back, or if Jesus came back. No one else could have done that as, as well as he did. And also wear, be wearing a, a, a tie inside the house. Right. Yeah. No, I don't think... I don't think it was a mistake to cast him. In fact, I noticed... Specifically, in this case, I was looking for casting credits. And Juliet Taylor is yes. Woody Allen's casting director. Has been since Love and Death. Mm -hmm. Has cast every one of his films since 1975. And I think if anyone is equally responsible for his success, it has to be her. All of the perfect choices that she's made. She cast Meryl Streep in basically Meryl Streep's third role. Mm -hmm. She provided the platform for Diane Weist to have a career coming from the stage, yeah. do, being fairly successful on stage, but using this as a springboard to a film career that's lasted for, what, almost 30 years now? And I think Michael Caine as well, because before this, uh, there's Blame It on Rio, and there are those <laughs> mid-80s choices that he made. There's some, there's some great ones in there, but I think... I think this was a turning point, or, or maybe a re-turning point for him. Back to great, 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 great films. What do you think? Uh, have you gone back and looked at Michael Caine's <laughs> late 80s, early 90s IMDb credits? No, I'm just going off of memory at this point. Selective memory, probably. But I, I don't think his headshot was at the top of the pile. I think I think it was an inspired choice. Well, she made a lot of them. In addition to all of the Woody Allen films, she was also casting director for Taxi Driver, Network, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, The Killing Fields, oh. The Exorcist, The Grifters. Yeah. Jeez, okay. She has made a lot of inspired choices over the yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. 
and Woody Allen himself credits her with having forced some of these decisions upon oh. him and him reaping untold benefits because of her yes. persistence with, with making some of these decisions. Makes sense. We talked about Michael Caine as an inspired choice, and uh, they all reaped, repped the benefits, reaped the benefits. Repped What's the Reaped. <laughs> reaped the benefits because repped. Michael Caine and Diane Weiss both won the Academy Awards in the Supporting Actor categories. And, and coming out of this film, they should have. They are clearly yeah. far and away the best to, especially Diane Weiss, her performance. It really is, to me, it's her movie. Because of the thing I was saying earlier, it's really a Holly story because if only because of where their redemption cycle ends versus yes. everyone else's mm -hmm. and all of the magnificent things that she does that we get to, as we get to watch her evolve and become the person that we see in that final frame. And again, fully on her own. Right. All, all, all earned. And I, you know, we talked a bit about what we notice newly with each moment the the thing that stuck out to me was the scene where she and hannah are arguing after hannah has read her first story mm -hmm. and she's got a reaction where her eyes her eyebrows sort of change where she realizes oh something's odd here that is a moment i never noticed before and was is beautiful to see well it's such a showcase for all three of them but for her in particular i was thinking about this the her winning that award and how just the general landscape, the cinematic landscape in 1986, how this film was probably unlike anything else, at least in mainstream cinema, in that you had this film that was so fully focused on women, great women and insufferable men in the margins. Mm -hmm. And when you, you look at the other films that were big in 1986... Um, you have to dig down to what? Legal Eagles. <laughs> Legal Eagles. To get to... Rod Stewart, do you want me to sing the theme song from Legal sure, Eagles? Sure, go ahead. Love Touch. Is that... That's the, uh, that's the extent of my singing. <laughs> okay. That wasn't so much singing. It's as... <laughs> as naming the title of right. it. The song is entitled Love Touch. <laughs> and it's in a movie called Legal Eagles. Right. Anyway... Uh, also in, in 96, I'm, I'm sorry, also also in 86, uh, you had Peggy Sue Got Married, which mm -hmm. I like, um, Pretty in Pink, which I hate, uh -huh. like I do all John Hughes. I saw Hughes. all of those in the theaters. Uh, and then what do we go to after that? Jumpin' Jack Flash? Whew, that was a dynamic female, yeah. The only other thing I can think of that was similar, but just didn't have the same impact, uh, was Crimes of the Heart. Okay. It was also 1986. Okay. That yeah. would have even been close in having that sense of it's three sisters female again. relationships in it. That would have been your only chance mm -hmm. to see that sort of thing on screen, aside from Hannah and her sisters, I guess. Yeah. But it also makes me wonder about other 1986, since you were 11. Yes. When you saw this the first uh -huh. time in 1986, and it made such a big impact on you. Yeah. I'm... I'm sort of running down a list in my head to think of what 11-year-old <laughs> Erica's top 10 movies in 1986 would now, have been. when did Summer School come out? It was not 1986. Dang it. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're going to have to refresh my memory because I, I went through some lists, but I don't remember everything from 86. So, so this would this be number one? At least as far? So far, yes. Yeah. Far how, and away. How but... about a little film called Back to School? <laughs> I think I've seen that five times. I'm pretty sure I saw it twice in the theater. Not once, but twice in the theater. Keep in mind, I didn't drive myself, okay? So an adult had to take me to that film. Right. Back to school starring Rodney Dangerfield. Um, so I remember being a pretty of big fan of it. Adult. <laughs> um, were you at the age yet where you would have appreciated nine and a half weeks? Uh, no, I think I saw that when I was 19, maybe, or 20, okay. so no. Uh, because I did watch so much Siskel and Ebert, I knew what it was, though. You, I, I knew of it. Right. Thank you. You knew of it, but you I didn't knew, know didn't what it was. I didn't know what it was. Okay. I'm not sure I still do, but anyway. So one hand and her sisters, yeah. two slot goes to back to school. <laughs> maybe. 
<laughs> Give me some other choices. The, the number three slot, possibly <laughs> under the cherry moon. Oh my gosh, have never seen it. I have. Are you kidding me? I have on cassette the original soundtrack because how could you not? Uh, no, I have never seen. I well, I was too young for that. I was I was way too young okay. for that because I was way too young to see uh, Purple, Purple Rain, Rain in the theater. Yeah, in the theater. Yeah, so I have not seen Under the Cherry Moon. Still haven't seen it. Okay. Well, you're not wow, missing a whole lot. Year. Yeah, same year. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I love we'll go back oh, in the God. direction that of things that you might have seen instead. Did Prince make another movie in 1986? Please, maybe I could have seen that one. No, Dang it! Just that one. Has he made a movie this year? Because mm. I would go. Okay. Um, Howard the Duck? No, I still, I've never seen that. Never seen Howard the Duck. Flight of the Navigator. No. I saw that a few years ago. What were you watching as as an 11-year-old? Evidently Hannah and her sisters multiple times. (laughs) Never saw, well, never, didn't see Flight of the Navigator then. I saw it a few years ago. Okay, I've got a surefire. I I know this was on your list. Is that the one with uh, Lance What's-His-Face? Or is that the one with, no. (laughs) Or is that the one with the kid who's kidnapped by the aliens in the 60s and then comes back? Which one was that? I think you're thinking of wild strawberries. <laughs> okay. Right. okay. What what else is on this the list? The surefire. I got one that okay. this will not miss. Killer. I know this has got to be on your top ten. Okay. American Anthem. Never seen it. Also, it has a great theme song, though, by the other guy from Duran Duran. Take it Am easy. Am I getting too excited? Yes. You... That's the name of the song, is Take It Easy. I didn't do that on purpose. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> One of the other tailors. John. Roger, I think. Okay. Andy? One of the other ones from Duran Duran did the, did the song. <laughs> Opie Taylor no, did that. No. No. Sorry, Mitch Gaylord. No, I never saw American Anthem. Did you see it? Because Janet Jones is on it. I did see it, but not then. I okay. saw it later. I think Last I saw week. it on... Uh, uh, Cinemax? No, did a did a double bill with Jim Cotta, maybe at the eighty second <laughs> Twin Drive In. Um, okay, how, all right, you're you're zero for zero. I'm striking pretty much. out. Okay, this has got to be on there. Okay, okay. Big Trouble in Little John. I've never seen it. Now you're just saying that to be no, funny. No, all of these movies. I think I was too young, or my. You know what? Take out the too young, too old, because the verdict was my first R-rated movie, and I was six years old, and I saw that in the theater. So it was whatever my mother decided she wanted to go to. So she didn't like any of these. She must not have. Okay, I've got one that she surely loved and took you to. Big Trouble in Little China, she must have. Anyway, go ahead. Soul Man. I saw that in the theater. (laughs) I saw Soul Man and Back to School in the theater. (laughs) God, this is embarrassing. Shanghai Surprise? <laughs> oh, no. And I'm a huge Madonna fan. One Crazy Summer. No, never seen it. But does that fall under sort of more, it's not a sex comedy, but teenager. Teen romp. Teen romp. I was probably too young, I guess. Lesser. My mother too old to be interested in that. Pretty in Pink, though. Lesser Teenage Cusack. Yeah, yeah. So you saw the the heavy hitters in 1986. Yes. You saw yes. Top Gun. Yeah. Absolutely. We were required by law we, as Americans right. to go see Top Gun. And evidently, did you not see it in the theater? When your family went through Ellis Island, they showed that too. Yeah. Are you saying that you were not an American then? Because that's the only way you could have gotten away with not seeing it in the I theater. I did see it in the theater. I okay. specifically remember right. the trip to see that movie. Phew. And the recriminations that followed. Bitter. Terrible. Meg Ryan wildly overacting in her doofus scenes. The weird, weird sex scene. Weird. Standing up and the one arm against the door frame. Weird stuff. That's weird. Weird. <laughs> so yeah. what you're saying is. Is. Is weird. Is weird. Yeah. Top Gun. Don't write checks with your, with your mouth that your butt can't cash. Or don't write checks with your butt that your mouth can't cash. What's the line? I think that's right. Okay. I think that's, I think the latter <laughs> is, is right. That's the best part of it. Now, it is 
funny that you talk about lists from 1986 because that's what led me to my recommendation. Okay. So may I talk about uh, my recommendation well, let's for have the episode? I, we haven't talked about it already. Okay. I no. haven't ruined it with Legal Eagles? No, or? you have not. Okay. Legal Eagles was not my pick. Now, I scoured through the list of films from 1986 because when I was trying to think of what my recommendation would be, I went off on 150 tangents like I always do, and I couldn't decide, oh, my favorite film of so-and-so and and whatever, and so I just decided, well, let's see what else was out there. And um, you were already talking about Legal Eagles, so I had to strike that off of my list, but... I discovered through then going through the British list from 1986, my recommendation, which is Sid and Nancy. Now, this is also really important for me because I hate biopics. Right. I am famously known across the uh, Americas as hating all biopics except for this one. So I think it is a fantastic choice. Also from 1986, Sid and Nancy, the story of Sid Vicious and Nancy Spungen. And I highly, highly, highly recommend it. It's got wonderful performances by Gary Oldman and Chloe Webb. And I highly recommend it, Sid and Nancy. One of the only biopics worth anything. Well, my pick is about as far in the other direction as you can go. Can't wait. I'm just this this seems like an easy and obvious one to me. I chose Fanny and Alexander. Ah. Ingmar Bergman's wonderful film from 1982 that was supposed to be his final film, his magnum opus essentially. The same way that Hannah and her sisters embodies the spirit of Thanksgiving. Mhm. Fanny and Alexander does the same thing for Christmas and family celebrations. It being Bergman is obviously a lot darker than Hannah and her sisters, but you can see in Fanny and Alexander a ton of those touchstones that are so important to Woody Allen. And I pick it probably because, at least the main reason is because it has such a similar effect on me in that it lingers. Mm. It's one of those things that it's not easily forgotten after you see it, and it seems to grow and grow in your mind. And similar to your reaction to Hannah and her sisters, it probably even takes on elements that aren't in the story, but that I inject into the story. And so my recommendation this time around is for Ingmar Bergman's Fanny and Alexander. You can see it in a variety of cuts, including a super long cut that was made for Swedish television that is sort of the definitive version of it. And I recommend any and all of them. It gave me a rosy glow. Oh, it certainly does that. Yeah. Good choice. Thanks. So please go watch Hannah and Her Sisters. It is worth watching. Would you agree? It's certainly worth watching over and over again. Yes. Many times for me. So that brings us to the end of the third episode of the podcast. You can get in touch with us if you'd like via our email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We have a Facebook page for the podcast at facebook.com slash magiclanternpodcast. We're on Twitter at lantern underscore cast. Or you can just go to our website, magiclanternpodcast.com and see all of our episodes and posts and supplemental material to these podcasts if you like. We are also on iTunes and Stitcher Radio, if either of those are your preferred method for listening to the podcast. If you get the time, we'd certainly appreciate it if you could subscribe or rate and review the show. Every little bit helps. Thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast.